Hello and welcome to the 11th episode of our Fundamental Principles of Communist Production and Distribution by the Group of International Communists Reading Group Series. Today is Wednesday the 24th of November 2021 and I'm your host Tom O'Brien. We finish our reading of Chapter 10, The General Social Work and plough through Chapter 11, The Accounting Ideal as an Ideational Summary of the Production and Distribution Process. Quite the mouthful. This week I have the new patrons Duncan Davis and Aike, and the returning patrons Nigel Walker and Ben Hanshu to thank. I have a pure glut of interview episodes to record over the next few weeks, so soon we'll be taking a break from all the reading groups for a while. If you like extra bonus episodes, creating Discord over in the Discord server, or joining in the patron reading groups, why not head on over to the Patreon and throw me a few commie dollar. Okay, enough of the bail booked, let's join the discussion. Welcome to the 11th reading group of the Fundamental Principles of Communist Production and Distribution. Today we're going to finish off chapter 10, where we were talking about the general social work. So this is, we've seen our formula for basically our communist tax rate, if you want to call it, or there's probably better names for it, to be honest, something like a shared social kind of contribution or something like that. The element which where consumption is based upon need and how how that gets paid for. Okay, so we're going to hit into section H. We didn't finish it last week. So anybody want to put up their hand to read a little bit of this bit here? Alan. Okay, H, the growth process of communism. In our considerations of the payout factor, it is important to keep an eye on the growth process here as well, as it is closely linked to it. As a characteristic feature of public operational units, we have mentioned that taking according to needs has been achieved here, so that the measure of working time for individual consumption no longer plays a role here. With the growth of communism, this type of operation will probably expand more and more, so that also food supply, personal transport, this is also individual consumption, housing service, etc., in short, the satisfaction of general needs will come to stand on this ground. Of course, it must always be considered in advance whether such a distribution for a particular sector does not involve too great a sacrifice for society. In any case, this is a process which, as far as the technical side of the task is concerned, can be carried out quickly. The more society grows in this direction, the more consumer goods are distributed according to this principle, and the less individual work will be the measure of individual consumption. Although working time plays the role of being the measure for individual distribution, this measure will be destroyed in the course of development. In this context, we recall what Marx said about distribution. The mode of this distribution will vary with the productive organization of the community and the degree of historical development attained by the producers. We will assume, but merely for the sake of a parallel with the production of commodities, that the share of each individual producer in the means of subsistence is determined by his labor time. What we show in our considerations is that the path of socialization of distribution of consumer goods is clearly determined. The working time is always only the measure for the part of the social product still to be individually distributed. This process of socialization of distribution does not take place automatically, but is linked to the initiative of the workers. But there is then also room for this initiative. If the production is organized to such an extent that a certain branch of industry, which creates a final product for individual needs, runs smoothly, then nothing stands in the way of integrating this branch of the industry into public operational units. All calculations in those companies remain the same. Here the workers do not have to wait until it suits the public servants until these gentlemen have sufficient control over industry because each operational unit or complex of operations is a closed unit in the calculation, the producers themselves can carry out the socialization. The production is very flexible due to its own administration. In this connection, it should be pointed out that the growth of communism will proceed at different speeds in different places. In one place, the need for cultural facilities will be more pronounced than in the other. Through the mobility of production, this difference in growth is also possible. For example, if the workers in one district want to set up several public reading rooms, they can do so without further ado. 
New institutions are then added, which have a more local significance, so that the necessary costs must also be borne by the district concerned. For this district, the payout factor will be changed, which has the effect of a local tax. In this way, the workers can shape life in its thousandfold shades themselves. It is precisely this growth process of communism that makes it necessary for the social costs to be determined by a payout factor and not by the detour of price increases, since this would directly limit self-activity and the shaping of one's own life. The process of growth from taking according to needs moves within fixed limits and is a conscious action of society. In contrast, the speed of growth is mainly determined by the level of development of consumers. The faster they learn to economize with the social product, i.e. not to consume it unnecessarily, the faster the distribution will be socialized. For the calculations of total production, it makes little difference whether there are many or few public operational units. As soon as an operational unit, which used to give its product to individual consumption in return for labor money, changes to the public type, the total budget for public operational units becomes larger and that of productive operational units smaller. The payout factor thus becomes smaller and smaller as communism grows. It can probably never disappear completely because it is in the nature of things that only those enterprises that supply general needs can change over to the public type. The manifold needs which arise from the special nature of the different people will hardly be able to be included in the social distribution. Be that as it may, it is not a matter of principle. The main thing is that general growth process of communism is firmly established while the practice of life forms the special shades. Okay. There's a lot in here. This is getting towards the lower to higher stage part of communism. So as the the amount that's taken for general social work goes up, that means that more of the society is based upon consumption, based upon need and not on individual work. OK, and when we talk about uh, moving, say, for example, uh, we're producing books publishing house in communism or something and we decided that we should move all books into take as need instead of having to pay for it the there is no level at which it needs to be monopolized to a certain extent by a few workers councils or whatever there's no need for that it's purely a logical distinction about whether the they fall into a gsw unit or whether their goods are paid for by consumption labor tokens or whatever so we see there that it's kind of like uh, the distinction there between whether it's one and the other it's kind of like whatever society itself decides it says here as well of course it must be always considered in advance whether such a distribution for a particular sector does not involve too great a sacrifice for society so what are they talking about here so like let's think about god i don't know Say, for example, if uh, people like sailing, I like sailing, people like sailing in uh, communism, should everybody be able to have uh, their own yacht based on need? Just somebody just rock up and take their own yacht. That would seem like to me to be something that would be <laughs> involved too great a, a sacrifice society if everybody could just like rock up and get themselves a yacht. OK, so like but when it comes to other stuff, like you would think that the cost would not be too great for society. So I think there's there's a debate to be had there amongst people about how these things enter into the general social work or not. There's also a little bit here at the end where he talks about the workers don't have to wait until it suits the public servants, until these gentlemen have sufficient control over the industry. Because each operational unit or complex of operations is a closed unit in calculation, the producers themselves can carry out the socialization. This production is very flexible due to its own administration. Now, I, I, I assume, you know, here there, when they say the producers themselves can carry out the socialization, they're not talking about the actual guild itself. Like it's not a choice for the guild or the individual factory councils, worker councils whether they should be producing for based on need or based on individual consumption, because that, you know, that could lead to weird outcomes. But uh, I think when he talks here about the producers themselves, he's talking about society. So just to kind of clear that up. Any Anybody have any thoughts on this section? There's quite a lot of other arguments. J Jitsi, Herman, I think. So I think this is a very difficult section in the book. And I I think it's really a contradiction to what they wrote before. Because in the beginning of the book, they 
more or less defined communism as uh, the direct relationship of the producer to the product. So, and the material basis for this was a working time calculation. So this means the social average uh, working time on the product side and the individual working time on the consumer side. So this, and they always put the emphasis on on the point that uh, with this way, uh, they can by themselves uh, control the whole organization of the society and are not dependent on decisions which are taken in, in some uh, bureaucracy above them. And I think with this, for me, very strange section H, they really contradict this because first with the growth process of communism, they really step back and and make something what what Marx, for instance, did not do. For Marx, it was in the um, lower and the higher stage, he always talked about communism. But if they say growth of communism, you can ask yourself, how can communism grow? Is there communism or is there not communism? So it cannot grow. But for them, it's it's the, this whole sector sounds as if there is a, or should be a development in order to be a real communism, it should be a development to the general social work. And the general social work, if we imagine that this is 100%, then this means economy in kind, which they before also said this is impossible. And it means at the same time that the whole organization or the whole society, all individuals are dependent on decisions which are taken in, in some, some higher organizations. So they, they really lose the control, which, which, I, which I before emphasized that this is really the point of the association of uh, free and equal people, that they by themselves can control it through the working time calculation. So now they say uh, they, they, should, they should really give this out of their hands. So they, I think they throw everything overboard here. I'm, I'm really I'm surprised that this is, a, I think it's an absolute contradiction to everything what they said before and what they say also in later chapters. Let me add one point. They say, for instance, on page 180, they say the faster they learn to e economize with a social product, EA, not to consume it unnecessarily. This is really a moral point of view. Before it was absolutely clear that they by themselves can make a relation of work to work because they can really control it by, by their working time calculation. But the more they move in this direction of a bigger uh, social uh, work, the more, of course, they have to learn that not to waste electricity or water. This is a moral point of view. Before, it was not a moral point of view because they really could see and for themselves, they could judge if it's worth for them to spend uh, or to consume so much because they, they knew how much work for them is uh, connected. And now they, they depend on a higher hierarchy to tell them how, how much they have to work and what they get for it. I think it's an absolute contradiction in the book. You know, it's interesting you say that this there's definitely that moral element in there. So, Herman, what are we saying how we should interpret what Marx says in the critique of the Gotha program in respect to this? Are we saying, let me just read a little bit here. In a higher phase of communist society, after the enslaving subordination of the individual to the division of labor, and therewith also vanishes the antithesis between mental and physical labor has vanished after labor has become not only a means of life, but life's prime want, after the productive forces have also increased with the all-round development of the individual and all the springs of cooperative wealth flow more abundantly, only then can the narrow horizon of bourgeois right be crossed in its entirety and society inscribe in its banners from each according to his ability to each according to its needs. So Marx is envisaging, you know, getting to a based on needs he is seeing that at some stage. Like, so how do we square this circle between what, what you're saying, Herman, and what Marx is saying there? Is it that Marx is basically saying, like, as we get so amazingly productive, our amount of time that people have to work, say, I work one hour a week or whatever, that it becomes inconsequential uh, with respect to, the, to, to what society is able to produce? Is that the general gist? 
Yes, I, I would say so. so. So Marx, he talks about communism in both stages. And I think what, when, when he takes up the higher stage of communism, then not in the sense that communism grows to a more ripe uh, form of communism. This he does not say. For him, communism is, is right from the beginning. But when, when he mentions the higher stage, I think he absolutely does this from his historical materialism's point of view. Because when you take those the three ifs and only then, which he, which he ended, the three ifs is more or less if the realm of necessity is overcome, if more or less everything is automated, that, that there is no, no real need for war connected because the productivity is so much developed. And I think from his historical materialism, he foresees that this could be, of course, a development. Then he says, The, the bourgeois legal horizon can be overcome. But for him, it's not in the beginning that he says, as long as the legal horizon of uh, bourgeois legal horizon cannot be overcome, there is, there is no, no real communism and we have to, to develop this into, into a ripe form. I think this is, it's, it's an absolutely misunderstanding what he says. It's, it's really his historical materialism and the three ifs is, is a realm of necessity At least this is how I understand it. Anybody else want to get in on this? Because I think this is very interesting. Alan? Yeah, I, I don't really find it really that contradictory, uh, but maybe we just aren't understanding it the same way. I feel like where you're seeing a, a moral imperative where we just have to learn not to waste our social product, there's implied along with that if we can increase the productivity of things that are distributed socially, then, you know, we can have a more, a more loose way of consuming it without, without it becoming wasteful. So I kind of see this as just a, I don't know, to, to me, it, this whole section feels like a more worked out version where, whereas Marx talked about or, or framed it in terms of a distinct lower phase and higher phase. It seems like here we're just fleshing it out a little bit of how you can, get to a so-called higher phase by a kind of continuous improvement process. And Macaroni? Uh, yeah, I guess I would kind of more agree in that I, I personally don't see it as being a particular contradiction, uh, kind of more, more in lines with what was just said. And something that I think is, is kind of part of that is this strikes me as being very much kind of part of the, the, the Council of Communist kind of critique of the way that industries were nationalized in and 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 were socialized in the Soviet Union where there was this sense of like you know we need to identify what are the you know what what are the industries where it's appropriate to begin you know socializing things what are the industries where it's appropriate to begin you know what what are which ones are mature and which ones are immature and i know in some other councilist texts they they spend a fair amount of time kind of critiquing the idea that there are mature and immature sectors of the economy that the like you know the economy itself is either mature or not And so I guess I interpreted this more kind of like along those lines where it's, it's not so much, as was said, a, a moral critique or, or about like, you know, hey, are you going to be able to figure out how to do it? But, but more in the sense that as you transition through like into communism, you are setting up the, the economy in a way in which you are producing at a rate where like if, if you're taking it out of something that you have to spend like your labor tokens on it's because you're producing it at a rate where you're not worried about wasting it or, or you're not worried about the overage costs or things like that. But I, again, I could be way off there. Look, uh, yeah, I'd like to come in a bit in defense of, of, of Herman's point here. If we, had a com if, we ha if we were to implement this system in the morning and we started quickly moving towards the FIC, the factor of individual consumption was tending close to zero, I think that we would have great difficulties with our current productivity levels in actually supplying people with uh, all the stuff that they would want and that we would end up having problems that we wouldn't have got over the material realities of shortages. So I, I think that there would have to be a, a long development period before you would get to a point in which personal your individual labor as a function of you know your your own consumption becomes um sorry what how does mark put it mark put it let me see here after the productive forces have also increased with the all-round development of the individual and all the springs of cooperative wealth flow more abundantly 
only then can the narrow horizon of Borto right be crossed in its entirety. You know, and I, I think that, that like, in a lot of, like, a communist kind of thought, uh, this idea of a jump to, full jump to based on a need, totally skips the kind of historical material kind of necessary steps for us to, uh, you know, I think I find it kind of ahistorical, to be honest, a bit. Uh, Herman and then Will. Yeah, and I think it's not only the historical steps of the development of the productivity. So I think as long as the work is connected to, to or necessary for the consumption, then it's it's uh, like uh, the abolition of uh, rationality. If I if I allow the society to take by need without taking into account the work which is connected to it. So take an example of water or electricity. Even even with this, if um, the society decides that this is free then this is rational for, for the people to waste energy because there is no work connected for them. It's they, you, you say to the people there is no work connected. So therefore, I think it's a wrong signal. And this is what they, they, what they before uh, emphasized, that it's absolutely important if the, if, the, if the people want to steer their economy by themselves, then they have to know how much work is connected with their consumption. Otherwise, they cannot take the rational decision if they want to spend more or less. And I think this is really the risk. The, the sooner uh, the, the communist society went to taking by need, the bigger the risk is that they really mess up the whole economy and and go back to to uh, to a moral to moralism and to to central steering. Yeah, I, I would say though you probably if we take the case of water or electricity, like you know, they do that under capitalism already, and they have like static. They do know like you know av- you know average uses. They have you know they're able to pl- to plan it fairly efficiently. I don't think even if the even if the FIC went to zero, so everything was based on need, you could still use the calculation of labor time to plan rationally, though, couldn't you? So, no, I, I, I think you, you cannot, because if you, if you skip the working time calculation for the consumption, then you have skipped it. So, if you, of course, you can keep, go go on with uh, the, with the information for the people, but then you have not skipped uh, uh, the measure of uh, working time for the consumption. So, either you skip it, then nobody knows any longer how much work is connected to the goods you provide for free, or you keep it. And I think they have to keep it. I suppose you could have a you could know the cost though. Sorry, I'll bring Will in. So he's been waiting there. Will you come in before I keep going? <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, so like this kind of tension between who gets to actually decide about what transfers and, and like who has actual control in the, the final thing has been there from the beginning. Like as soon as you introduce the FIC, you're basically saying, you know, society, the total needs of society get a claim on every individual producer. And so you need to know prior what all those needs are going to be. And then you can extract that from the producers. So like there's always been this kind of tension in the proposal. So like, I, I do see them kind of reneging on what they kind of tried to promise in terms of the independence of producers w- when they moved to this proposal for the society giving leave to move into new social sectors. But, I, you know, to me, it makes kind of sense, right? Like, how can you fully socialize it without it being handed over to like the control of society? And then the other tension that is kind of in the bourgeois right, in the one-to-one correspondence between, you know, work put in and what you get out is the kind of eat or starve background, right? And it's really a question of like how much of that is gonna be in there. Because, you know, if you just think about like the social democratic kind of things, interventions we do, right? It's, or what people's budgets look like. It's things like housing, transportation, education, food, right? Like that's what most of people's budgets are. And so it's like, do we guarantee those or not? And if you do say we're going to guarantee them, then like the FIC is going to be pretty high because that's most of what the economy is, right? It just seems like, you know, everyone's going to get a house or we don't. If they do, that's like a third, you know, that's at least 30% of the FIC, right? 
Yeah, I mean, like, but that's also a function of speculation and land rents and all that kind of stuff, too. So I would think the actual cost of housing as a, you know, like you're talking about uh, a, a huge reduction on housing cost right there. Like the, the price of houses in most Western countries has tripled in the last 30 years. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? So mm -hmm. I, I, yeah, but I, I still, I get you, I take the point. Absolutely. Yeah. No, it's, uh, there is this tension, undoubtedly. Like one thing I would say, maybe push back a little bit on Herman. Sorry, I'm pushing every which way here today. But it, like there is, even if things were supplied based on need, you could still have the, the, the labor time price on it, if you know what I mean. You could still say this thing that you're getting for free is this took a lot of labor to produce. So it's not like you won't have that calculation if you're still if you're still recording the labor time for planning purposes, even if not for the consumption purposes. So, like, if somebody takes a Ferrari, a combi Ferrari, whatever, but, like, you know, they will see that this is, like, this has got a 10,000 labor hours versus uh, this other car over here. So, you know, I think there's, it's probably not as simple as saying you won't have any idea, but I, I think there's a definite tension. I think uh, also the tension is, like, one that Herman pointed out to me is the losing control of production. You know, like, if you choose as a person to say, oh, I only want to work 10 hours or 15 or I want to work five or 30 hours. You're, you're, you're choosing your what you want to do based on what you want to consume in your life, the products and the outputs that you get. But if you are, if everything has gone based on need, then basically society is governed by these kind of aggregates, the aggregate consumption of society. So me as an individual, I'm getting 100%. My work is being determined by everything everybody else does but like there's a kind of that would undoubtedly lead to a lack of control for the individual so there's a tension there like and i think mark seems to be making the point it's only true like hyper productivity do we get away from this bourgeois ideal of that i i work that's mine to the extent that we're you know it's it's all free and no one gives a damn like that's a, a very very high stage of development which personally i don't think is anywhere close to what our current development rate is any other this is this section has really kicked off a lot of thought uh, a, a lot of comment there's one there's one section here actually page 180 another one here that I, I wrote down a point here this is getting to the point we had like this kind of recurring argument argument discussion whatever a couple of weeks ago about the difference between like the fic and then having like consumption taxes levied through prices okay so I just want to read this bit. It is precisely this growth process of communism that makes it necessary for the social costs to be determined by a payout factor and not the detour of price increases, since this would directly limit self-activity in the shaping of one's own life. So this is with respect to like the idea of local taxes. So let's say we wanted to build a swimming pool here in my area, London, and it was going to cost 20 million quid. And that was a tax put in this locality. And if this was done at the point of, say, a price, so say they increased the prices of certain goods to get that, as opposed to a, a deduction from your labor time, what you would end up having then is a price in the economy, say, in locally for a good that would be slightly higher than, or, or quite a good bit higher maybe than goods outside the economy. And you end up having arbitrage situations. So I think the, the deduction from the, the payout for me, it's just absolutely the way to go. You don't end up with those arbitrage situations. You don't end up with losing the rationality of labor time planning and the price. Okay. Anybody else have any comments here? Are we good to move on? Alan? Uh, just a real quick one. So if I understood Herman and I think you, Tom, kind of made the same point, the, the risk of kind of prematurely going towards a 100% you know, social or you know, free distribution I agree with that. And I think that's why this section is called, you know, growth process of communism. I, I think process is the key word there. And I, I sort of took that to be in reference to a, a long running historical process. But I do agree that if you just try to go to 100% take according to need that you do run into irrationality and, and all that. So I, I just think this is kind of trying to flesh out what the historical process would be to get from the take according to contribution to take according to need. It, it's not something that you would want to just slam to 100% on day one, obviously. 
Yeah, and I know Herman sent me some stuff on this during the week from, I think, other writers in the Council Communists, but I haven't had a chance to read it yet, Herman. Was there stuff on this particular point? No, it, it was some articles uh, members of, of the group of international communists published in uh, different magazines, and they are also a little bit on this point, and I think um, here they have a little bit more the emphasis on what I said before, that the direct relation of producer to the product is absolutely crucial for the establishment of a communist uh, society. Okay, cool. So, Alan, do you want to take this last little section before we go into the next chapter? Uh, mixed operational units. However, to avoid misunderstandings, it is necessary to point out a complication that the socialization of the distribution for the determination of payout factor entails. The point is that this socialization also brings into the public domain operational units that do not work exclusively for individual consumption. For example, a power station. As far as it supplies light and electricity to households, it works for individual consumption. However, to the extent that the electricity is transmitted to the various operational units, it functions as raw material. Accordingly, this should be considered when calculating the production time of the products. In other words, the electricity plants must not supply free of charge here. For this reason, the transport of goods should never be included in the take-as-needed category, as a final product is consumable only at its destination. These operational units, which realize take-as-needed for individual consumption, and on the other hand, consume their product as a means of production or as a raw material in the production process, are called mixed operations. It goes without saying that their number will increase with the increasing socialization of individual distribution. However, the question now is what complications this will entail for the payout factor, since the social costs do not fully cover consumption by mixed operational units, but only for the part that works for free. As soon as the GSW budget also includes mixed companies, it contains on the one hand a statement on how many means of production and raw materials are withdrawn from society, and on the other hand, how many means of production and raw materials are passed on by them in the production process. Through a simple deduction, we then determine how many means of production and raw materials are still covered by the social costs. For those who love formulas, we'll like, we would like to express those mentioned above in the payout factor, and those who don't like it can skip it because it says exactly the same thing but only in a different language. Okay, so they have a, ex an extension of our FIC for formula for the individual payout that takes into consideration these mixed enterprises which supply some of their products based on distribution based on need and some based on the labor time consumption. So I don't think we need to, unless anybody has anything to say on this one, I don't think it, it's more of a technical little note than anything else. You know, in reality, those that FIC calculation will probably get a little bit more complicated as other things get factored in. But that's as kind of uh, as as far as they go in the book here in complicating it. I think, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, okay, we're on to chapter eleven. So this is the the accounting as an ideational summary of the production and distribution process. So anybody want to throw up their hand here to do a bit of reading here? Macaroni is brave, Mac. Let's dive in. <laughs> Let's do it. The, account, uh, the accounting as an ideational summary of the production and distribution process. A, the importance of bookkeeping in general. The accounting of capitalist enterprise generally has the sense that it must give the entrepreneur an insight into whether he has worked profitably or at a loss, recording all his income and expenditure of his assets and debts. In addition to this general overview, the individual sections of the accounts give him an insight into all the movement of his assets. When the capitalist checks his company books in his office, he will find there a summary of the production and distribution process of his business. He can see what and how much has been put into the business and what and how much has been taken out. It is important to note that bookkeeping is a completely passive function. Bookkeeping is nothing more than a kind of photograph of what has happened in the business. It is a kind of miniature mirror that truthfully reflects the events of the huge factories in a concise form. The bookkeeping is the ideational summary of the company. The communist society also has its ideational summary in its books. Here too, we find an accurate record of the goods traffic that flows through the operational unit. On the one hand, 
we get an overview of the amount of social work that flows into the operational unit in the form of raw materials and means of production. On the other hand, we see the quantities of products delivered that flow out again. Besides, we can see how many working hours were required for the transformation process from raw material into product. Or to illustrate it with the concrete examples mentioned above, F plus C plus L, machines plus raw materials plus labor for equals 40,000 pairs of shoes, 1,250 working hours plus 61,250 working hours plus 62,500 working hours equals 125,000 working hours. Okay, that's a kind of a trivial little section, but I think it's pointing towards something deep as the idea of the books as a kind of like, they're like essentially like a map, aren't they, for capitalism? You know, like for your firm, it's like a map of representation, you know, that you can see and you can go everywhere, but it just contains the the necessary details for you to like, like for a map, you find your way around, you know, the globe or whatever. But in, in this, it, it it's like a, a, a snapshot that allows you to see the operational life of the business. Okay, Mac, I think we'll keep going. Can you do the next section? Sure. B, gyro transactions as settlement. Gyro, I this was a word I didn't <laughs> I never learned before I read this. Gyro yeah, transactions yeah. as settlement. Yeah, some people call it some people call it gyro, like uh, some people call it gyro. I would have called it gyro, but I know in Italy it would be gyro. So okay, gyro transactions as settlement. However, as soon as goods are brought into or out of the operational unit, it comes into contact with other operations. And since it is one of the lay idea of capitalism as well as communism, when one believes that the goods can be transferred without charging, the receiving operational unit must charge the incoming goods against the supplying operational unit. The question is, how is this done? In capitalism, this is done either by direct payment in cash or, uh, and this is the usual way of settling, by paying the amount through a bank or giro office. In this case, it is merely a transfer or wiring. The payments are made without the money being put into circulation. It is a cashless transfer. Leichter believes that life practice must decide whether these two forms of settlement should be retained under communism. He says to this, all material conditions of production, all semi-finished materials, all raw materials, all auxiliary materials supplied by other production plants to the processing plant are charged, invoiced to it. The question of whether this will result in cash payment with working hours or accounting charges, i.e. cashless transactions, will be best solved by practice. Indeed, practice will have a decisive say. In principle, however, a payment with working hour money bypassing the gyro office is fundamentally wrong. This is why we firmly reject this here since it is a theoretical study. In the course of development, all settlements must be carried out by a central gyro office. For just as each individual operational unit needs an ideational representation of the production process, so much more is needed for the entire operational life of the society. If all settlements are carried out via the gyro, then we will have here a complete record of all goods trafficked through the entire society. It is the general social accounting of the production distribution process. If, however, some of the settlements took place outside of these accounts, we do not have this registration, i.e. we cannot speak of a general social accounting system. This is one of the reasons why communism must reject direct charging in working hour money, and that is why we do not use the term working money, but instead speak of consumption money. This is to express that these instructions on products can only be used for the purchase of the individual consumer goods and not for the settlement between operational units. Okay, so this is interesting stuff like in the soviet union they had three types of rubles as far as i can remember they had the kind of international ruble that they would use in international trade which i think was gold back most of the time they also had consumers consumption rubles uh, but then they had a, a third type which was the the rubles that were basically used for accounting between firms and so what I, they seem to be making a mirror argument here that you have uh, essentially like cashless transactions on the books, transactions between operational units, and then you have like a, a separate consumption money, you know, which would have a one-to-one -one pegging, but like that the transactions going on between like the, the firms themselves wouldn't have, you know, wouldn't require cash. 
you know and even uh, you know as we go towards today you know even our you know i'd say the vast majority of transactions now are actually cashless they probably kind of the distinction between this kind of cashless and cash society uh, our, our distinction of money is, is breaking down more and more so that it, even consumption money is 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 essentially cashless in inverted commas I, I i think this section is very interesting because uh, there's one bit here in the course of the development all settlements must be carried out by a central giro office or gyro office now look i think that the kind of decentralized nature of blockchain type or distributed ledgers probably a better way of saying it lead to the kind of lack of need for this centralization over the the giro office i know in our discord we have a a user called zernami who's been like putting together some proposals for a decentralized kind of essential ledger like where you would talk about in the principles here which is very interesting it would seem to me like to fit very closely to the general decentralized nature of the proposals in this book for the operational units that the the gyro office itself could be decentralized but you know that now we're getting into like implementation um how about yeah will so to do all of these calculations right like for payouts and stuff you need to know the F, the factor of individual consumption right which as, as was just alluded to earlier in the passage you could do it at a different level right you could have a, a local tax but you you do need to like have this centralized information accounted for in the transactions, right? So I, I would envision it being federated, right? But you know, I don't think like a kind of trustless mathematical system would really work. Like you have to actually it will be a trusted. It mightn't be trustless. That's why I want to get away from yeah. like yeah. a blockchain and more towards a distributed ledger. Yeah. But like you could you like the, the idea would be, I think, would be that you could. Well, I think one part of it would be, you know, that the uh, I, I don't know. Let's not get into the technicalities. of it. I just think it's an interesting I think there's it's an interesting thing for us to actually look at. That's the way I put it, whether it would end up working. I know you're trying to get towards the point of could you say, for example, like there would have to be a general societal pool of the FIC funds, for example, we would have mm. to pay to this one. Like, how does that interact with, like, a distributed ledger system? Is that the point, essentially? Uh, well, no, the, 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 the kind of the, the distribution, the distributed system is kind of at odds with the core, like, logic of some of this stuff, right? Like, it is a kind of, it, it would have to be, like, federated because that's how the FICs would work and you need to take in that, those into account, right? And so if you do it completely decentralized without, you know, incorporating these semi-central decisions about what we're going to allocate things for then yeah you, you okay yeah. Sense, right so yeah. like that, that's my point yeah 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 no there's definitely yeah like there's that you know it's definitely stuff there donal has his hand up yeah um i think those are really good points just one thing i wanted to tie it back to the the discussion before this is how i kind of envisage the thing and maybe uh people would object to to this kind of idea but if you had this kind of so imagine you have like a you know, a debit card like you would have today or whatever, and it's connected to this kind of ledger. You know, what I was really thinking was that in order to kind of maintain that link that we were talking about before between production and consumption that's kind of been lost by the GSW units, that the ledger would assist with kind of maintaining that because, and this is, again, just this isn't from the book. This is just just, just a thought I had, that... So when the when the GSW units would be providing something for for free, essentially, you know that there would be or there could be a sort of a voucher in place of a labor voucher, which is something, not nothing, but it has a cost of zero. Like for example, the local council authority here says they're going to give all of us uh, three pints for free in the pub, which uh, we all approve of uh, every month uh, per person or whatever, you know and uh, some very specific kind of product that they're they're going to buy from the producer firm and provide it for free in exchange through the ledger for not for nothing for something but for something which is valued at zero if you understand and so the link between the product and the producer could be maintained through a ledger and you know the producer firm is still credited with their expenses by the regional uh, council authority so that's just some thoughts maybe that doesn't make sense but... 
you know that, that that's how I envisage it as well. Yeah, like so that they would essentially, in some level, there'd be an you know an FIC fund would our taxation would go into the general fund, which would then go back to pay for those three pints to that brewery for the three pints. That's essentially what you're you're saying. Yeah, right, exactly. And I think that it's correct as well that the that the the ledger would have to be somehow federated so that it can take account of these you know different local taxes. I think that's right. Yeah, definitely. All that would have to be, you know, it's a technical implementation. Sometimes we can get carried away with the decentralized nature of kind of blockchain stuff and, you know, as opposed to the practicalities of, of it working. So it's definitely, I'm not I'm not making a, a, a case for, <laughs> I would just think it's some, probably something that could be interesting to look at. Uh, perhaps there is some way of distributing that kind of core well, you would think that there would be a risk in having a central, like, Jiro office, just fundamentally. Like, what happens if a, there's a war and, a you know, a capitalist state comes in and destroys your Jiro office, you know, hacks into it, destroys the records? There's probably quite a lot of risk associated with it centrally. I know there's a lot of things you could do, probably, but maybe it's not in the design of the system so much. There's one thing here as well, which is, I think, fairly important, is if all settlements are carried out via the gyro, then we have here a complete record of the goods trafficked through the entire society. Like, I think there are very much privacy issues around this. Like, I would like to see, like, the, the settlement of public goods should be open, but I think the settlement of private consumption for me should be encrypted somehow. There's, a, there's distinct privacy issues with people being able to see individual consumption Okay, let's move on. Okay, hands up. Who, who's, who's going to take us to the next section? Will. C, transformation of terms. No income, no expenditure. After these preliminary remarks, we can take a closer look at the communist accounting of the individual operational units. Although it may seem like hair splitting to many, we want to do it because it deepens our understanding of the essence of communism we will see that the accounting terms, profit and loss, income and expenditure, assets and liabilities, lose their validity under communism. Even though a large part of these terms will continue to live on in the language of communism, it is necessary to understand that they took on completely different content. To recognize the character of the changes in terms, we must start from the new social relations, i.e., the new legal order. In other words, neither the operational unit nor the manufactured product is the property of the operational organization. They are common goods, which it manages in the name of society. Therefore, the activities of the operational unit cannot be considered as a change in the assets and liabilities of the operational unit and are therefore not linked to actual income and expenses. The operational unit can speak of the quantity of goods which it has taken out of the company and which it passes on to the society. Once an operational unit has delivered products, this is recorded in the operational accounting, and this amount is transferred from the current account of the receiving operational unit to the account of the delivering operational unit. However, this only means that society has registered this goods traffic. The amount thus appears in the accounts, but does not have the character of income. It is a simple registration. The same applies if the operational unit purchases production, means, or raw materials from another operational unit. In this case, although, it is established how many working hours were spent on this product by the society, and although the general Giro office transfers this amount to another account, it is by no means an expense, just as it is not and income for the other operational unit. Again, this is merely a registration of the transport of goods. Instead of debit credit in the current accounting system, the terms should therefore be used withdrawn from community. What comes into the operational unit as a means of production or as a raw material expressed in working hours, also the consumption of consumption money, passed on to the community the quantity of the delivered product. Right. I think they're they're pretty catchy, aren't they? Withdrawn from the community and passed onto the community. <laughs> I, I don't think they'll uh, 
take the place of debit or credit too quickly. <laughs> no, I think this is uh, this is good stuff. I like this little section here. We will see that the accounting terms profit and loss, income and expenditure, assets and liabilities lose their validity under communism, even though a large part of these terms will continue to live on in the language of communism. It is necessary to understand that they took on completely different content. It'd be interesting to see how many like how many kind of feudal terms are still floating around in capitalism that we don't even cop on. Okay, I think we'll will you take the last section and then we'll and then we're finished for today, I think. Is it the last couple of pages? Will we try D? Sure thing. D. Transformation of terms. No gain, no loss. Just as the operational unit does not have income or expenditure, neither does it have profits or losses. The operational organization only records how much social work it has taken from society in the form of F, C, and living labor, and returns the same amount to society, but in a different form, in the form of the product it produces. It cannot, therefore, have surpluses or deficits. We can also express the same phenomenon differently. We can also say that profitability is unknown. But even if the profitability is unknown, the rationality of the operational unit is well known. It may well be that society believes that the quantity of products supplied is too small. This would not mean that the operational unit with a deficit would work with a loss, but it would show that in this unit, the production time of the product would be too high above the social average. The society, or on behalf of the latter, the operational organizations of the whole industrial sector could hold this operational unit accountable so that it could, should explain why its production time is so much higher than in other similar operations. E, the importance of communist accounting. And this brings us to the characteristic difference between capitalist and communist accounting. Both give an ideational summary of the operational unit. However, in the case of capitalism, it is important to determine whether profit or loss has been made. Under communism, on the other hand, it is not only about self-control over the production in the operating unit, but also about the responsible management of the social goods that are passed on to society. F. The General Social Accounting The ideational summary of operational life in general social accounting is not an imaginary or a constructed measure but the natural result of the strict introduction of the average working hours in society as the supporting force of production and distribution. Thus, the whole operational life becomes one, while the recording of the transfer of goods automatically gives an overall view of all social activity. In this way, therefore, the general accounts of production and consumption of society as a whole are produced. Here we have, uh, we find an overview of the entire social inventory and the description of how it is used. Of course, there is no information in this inventory, such as so many drills or so many lathes, so many pickaxes, etc., etc. However, it shows how many means of production each industry uses, how much raw materials and living labor it consumes. In other words, it shows how social work is distributed in a fixed form, means of production and raw materials and in a fluid form, living labor among the various social activities. This then also means that all the elements for so-called planned production can be found here. This bookkeeping is bookkeeping in the true sense of the word, and it is nothing more than bookkeeping. It is, however, the central point where all the rays of operational life flow together. Still, this economic center does not have the leadership, not the administration, not the power of control over production and distribution. The operational organization of the general social accounting has only something to say, only in its own unit. But this does not result from this or that decree of the council congress, nor is it dependent on the goodwill of the workers of the clearing office, but is determined by the course of production itself. Okay. Thanks for that, Will. So there's a, a lot of interesting stuff there. So, uh, yeah, okay. It cannot, therefore, have surpluses or deficits, talking about the individual, say, factory worker councils. 
we can also express this this same phenomenon differently. We can also say that profitability is unknown. Like this is a, a a very major point, I think, for people to get their head around why this system essentially breaks the capitalist value form. You know, we don't have this idea of the individual operational units like in capitalism, private firms competing against each other so that they don't go bust. We have a very different idea where certain individual units are more or less productive. But as a, as a, as a unit together, they reproduce themselves. You know, it's a much more kind of a, a solidarity kind of a thing. We, we reproduce ourselves and then we help the separate units become more productive and achieve the average. So, and he he talks here about so it's it's just a fundamentally one of the f- fundamental ways to break that value form. Not only the the post hoc planning of the market, but the competitive element driving certain decisions and factories out of work and destruction of capital left, right, and center based upon you know the the comp- competitive element. The society, or on behalf of the latter, the operational organizations of the whole industrial sector could hold this operational unit accountable so that it should explain why its production time is so much higher than the than in other similar operations. So while it's not a, a competitive uh, relationship, there is also this, you will have to justify your use of common goods. Uh, so like there is a conditioning within the society towards people not being uh, efficient but it's it's not the same conditioning as occurs in the marketplace anybody have any comments on that oh there's one uh, there's one thing here donald uh, you've been doing some we've been kind of chatting offline about some of this oh there's a line here on page 192 where he talks where he says of course there is no information in this inventory such as so many drills so many lades so many pickaxes etc cetera, etc cetera. However, it shows how many means of production in each industry uses, how much uh, raw materials and living labor it consumes. Like, I think there is no reason why we shouldn't be able to record even physical outputs in our transactions. It seems like something that would be highly advantageous. Yeah, well, I think what we have now, which is sort of probably was unimaginable at one time, is the... Uh, you were talking about SKUs or the universal product code, you know, which is allows for the exact categorization of every product and the immediate sort of uh, distribution of information through the internet about every stock, you know, of every product. So, um, yeah, that would obviously, like, to not use that would be very strange, I think. Yeah, because you could literally uh, look to see if you had if you had a list of all the all the physical quantities and stuff used in, say, the production of a certain product, and then you were making a decision on you know in the planning process of say, oh, well, let's say we want to build uh, a a new bridge between Ireland and England or something, and you want to see what effect that would have on different industries, say, for their concrete production and who's using it what. Which sectors maybe should we deprioritize or prioritize, or have we got the capacity? So it would be something that you would really want to know. So I think that that would be something that our modern technology would allow it to. It would be a, a great addition in trying to be able to plan exactly society. There's another sentence here that I, I, I kind of don't think this sentence is correct. In other words, it shows how social work is distributed in a fixed form means of productions and raw materials, and in a fluid form, living labor among the various social activities. Like for Marx, like uh, the raw materials wasn't fixed. That's circulating capital. So I, I feel like that sentence is uh, a bit incorrect from a kind of a Marxist uh, economic point of view. And then finally, this section here, this quick sentence. Still, this economic center, so this is the bookkeeping, the general uh, bookkeeping for the society, does not have the leadership, not the administration, not the power of control over production and distribution. So compare this to essentially the bank under capitalism. Like the bank, you know, this is kind of like a an analogy, somewhat analogous to the, the banking sector, you know, the recording of all transactions. Like the banking sector has power over creation of credit. It's able to direct, you know, in the UK here, 
it basically directs all <laughs> yeah all new credit towards the housing industry essentially you know compared to like industry it's nearly all goes towards speculative land and building so like the they have control over over production to a large extent the bank they're essentially like uh, capitalist planning organizations decentralized well not not that decentralized planning organizations but this this form we have here of the accounting the general gyro office or whatever the hell kind of uh, outdated name we have it here in the book like it doesn't have that function it's more like a it's more akin to a like a, a, a you know a map of uh, the economic society than a a leadership administration or uh, you know credit creation role anybody have anything to say then from this last bit before we wrap up Okay, we're all sold on the accounting. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Okay, so next week we will have a look at, so we'll have a go at chapter 12. It's 20 pages long. Hopefully that'll be okay. We should be able to get through it. So this is the abol abolition of the market. I'm sure we'll see you all. I'll say goodbye and we'll see you all next week. Same time, same bad channel. On this episode, you heard the theme tune The Order of the Pharaonic Jesters and Night of the Purple Moon by Sun Ra and his orchestra. Thank you for listening and please join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. This show is a member of the Emancipation Network, a Marxist podcast research collective. Make sure to check out our network sister podcasts General Intellect Unit, Jumpsuit Utopia, Mortal Science, and Swampside Chats. And if you'd like to help out the show, please remember to head over to Patreon and throw me a few commie dollar. Bye.